Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor and pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank the um, organizing committee and the, um, the volunteers for the um, opportunity to, to be here and, and talk about this topic. Um, I'm really excited to share this information for, uh, with you, and I look forward to a, a, a discussion and dialogue afterwards. This is my disclaimer. Uh, the comments and statements uh, of this presentation are solely my own and in no way reflect my uh, employer or other uh, uh, medical uh, establishment. So what is a cardiovascular surgeon? Um, this is a typical day for me, seeing a patient that's uh, having a, a serious heart event, um, evaluating them and working with a team of uh, physicians and nurses and uh, actually uh, operating on them to uh, uh, help them. And uh, this is an example of an open heart uh, surgery and this is what I'm looking at uh, most of the time. So I actually get the opportunity to uh, touch and feel uh, the manifestations of, uh, of heart disease. And uh, through that, uh, it's really intrigued me, obviously, about uh, the causes of heart disease, but also um, interventions we could possibly do to help patients that both have heart disease as well as uh, to prevent heart disease. So why am I here? Uh, well, it, nothing is more rewarding to me than being able to uh, help a patient uh, it, that's in a very serious medical condition um, do a, an operation and see them recover uh, over a several week period of time and get back into a uh, normal, uh, vigorous, uh, healthy lifestyle. And that is very rewarding to me, but obviously there's probably more to the story than just uh, physically uh, correcting uh, surgically the situation. There's got to be more to the story about uh, prevention as well as uh, a treatment. And so I, I think that there's a uh, um, this is where a great opportunity lies with the Ancestral Health uh, Society and Symp Symposium, uh, and I think there's more to uh, bring to the table, uh, literally, uh, than just our scalpel and other uh, medical interventions. And so there, we're all uh, familiar with farm-to-restaurant or farm-to-table uh, uh, um, concepts now, but I think there's a new concept in farm-to-table healthcare. Uh, and that's where we can uh, implement uh, many of the nutritional advances, uh, science and research that uh, is being published and, and many people are working on, and, and try to integrate these in a constructive way into uh, healthcare uh, to, uh, to make a difference for our patients. So uh, this talk uh, is really, I'm going to talk about uh, the evolving healthcare environment and how the whole uh, Paleolithic uh, ancestral health uh, movement uh, uh, works with this. I'm going to talk about uh, the evolutionary origins of uh, heart disease. I'm going to uh, talk about the emerging new paradigms for uh, causing and understanding uh, the cause of heart disease. And then most importantly, I want to wrap up, and this may be uh, where a lot of our discussion lies, but uh, um, answer the question of how we can help patients and physicians better communicate uh, we, with each other about emerging an ancestral health uh, data. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, seen this book, aren't familiar with this, it's a new publication, but it's, uh, it's a wonderful manuscript uh, by Dr. Eric Topol, uh, one of the uh, leading uh, cardiologists in the United States. But he wrote this uh, book recently called The Creative Destruction of Medicine, How the Digital Revolution Will Create Better Healthcare. And I think it has huge implications about how healthcare is rapidly undergoing evolution. And I really encourage you to take a look at it, not just from an ancestral health standpoint, but from an overall healthcare environment standpoint. In this uh, uh, book, or he mentions uh, that in old mass medicine, we treat all patients with the same diagnosis, with the same drug, at the same dose, and we do screening tests for all patients for a condition even though only a tiny fraction are even at risk. He also says, when you can sequence a whole human genome or track every vital sign and physiologic metric continuously via wearable biosensors, then we can make quantum steps forward to understanding the essence of what makes each individual tick. The science of individuality and, new, and, and a new practice of precision medicine compared with today's population medicine. So this is where we're evolving, and this is where I think we need to begin to integrate um, um, a lot of these concepts into uh, healthcare because the, the opportunity exists. It's not just uh, ancestral health. Obviously, the digital revolution is changing the way we practice, and it's certainly accelerating change. But um, we also know that uh, patients are no longer willing to just accept uh, what the doctor tells them. Um, uh, they are doing their own research and questioning everything. So patients are coming in, better informed, and actually uh, 
questioning the doctor about why are you uh, prescribing this or why aren't you doing something. And uh, we as, as physicians and healthcare providers need to be uh, uh, knowledgeable about uh, the type of uh, role that our patients are doing in driving their own healthcare. Um, and, and I think this consumer-driven healthcare, uh, the opportunity exists to engage physicians and other healthcare professionals in a dialogue of the scientific merits of an ancestral health approach. And this is the precision medicine that uh, Dr. Topol mentioned. And I think this is where we can begin in that dialogue because that dialogue already exists um, and we can just uh, further enhance that. Well, you've heard a lot in this conference and uh, some from some of the previous speakers about uh, many of the evolutionary origins of our um, health. Um, but uh, I think that many of us are familiar with the um, advent uh, of agriculture called the Neolithic transition. It uh, happened around 10,000 years ago, and it began in the Fertile Crescent uh, of Egypt. And uh, we knew that, or we know from study that uh, those, that, that agricultural re revolution um, led pe uh, people to be more prone to disease. Uh, there was increased skeletal lesions, perhaps from an increased infectious disease from um, study of, uh, of um, our ancestors. Uh, they know that uh, those patients or those people live shorter lives, they were less well fed, they had chronic malnutrition and smaller stature, all as a result of the Neolithic uh, transition. And one of the very first uh, descriptions, uh, uh, confirmed descriptions of heart disease began in ancient Egypt um, um, after the uh, obviously ad advent of the agricultural uh, transition. And we know this from the papyrus uh, manuscript, and, and this is a quote from that, it said, if thou examinest a man for illness in his cardia, and he has pains in his arms, in his breasts, and on one side of his cardia, is death threatening him? And that description is actually quite accurate to uh, what we have in many of our uh, textbooks uh, today. Well, I wanna highlight this study if you haven't seen it, because for me, this is a, a really important study in um, where um, our evolutionary um, history has impacted our health um, in modern society. And um, this study, called the Horus study, looked at 52 Egyptian mummies. And the reason that they used Egyptian mummies was this was the very uh, first and earliest preserved um, humans that we have. Obviously, everything before that was archaeological and bits and pieces out of the sand and dirt. Uh, but here, we have the earliest preserved um, humans. And uh, some of these humans from the mummies were dating back to about 3500 uh, BC, so about 5,000 years ago. And they took these mummies and actually uh, put them through a CT scanner. And with that uh, diagnostic tool, uh, looked at the hearts of these mummies to see what, uh, what, hat, what transpired or what shape those hearts were in. And um, 44 of the 52 mummies actually had a preserved heart. Uh, and 45% of those uh, that had a preserved heart had cardiovascular disease. And this is uh, 5,500 years ago. Here's an example or a picture of uh, this actual study, and you could see here uh, that uh, this is very consistent with what I would see on a CAT scan uh, in, in um, many of our today, uh, population today, and you could see here, uh, here's some disease in the left domain coronary artery, uh, as well as uh, in the superficial femoral artery. Uh, when they looked at these, uh, these mummies and you classified them, you could see that uh, overall the age range was anywhere from 27.5 years to about uh, 40 to 50 years at the age of death. So these were relatively younger patients that have manifestation of, of heart disease. And so obviously the lifespan was shorter, but think about it, uh, you know, th these people are developing heart disease at a very, very early onset. In, in our society, uh, it's about 60 to 70 years of age is a typical onset, and here we're talking about a much younger age. And you can see the, the penetrance of this disease is quite uh, significant in these people. It's not an insignificant finding. So my question is, what are the implications for heart disease in the 21st century now that we know that some of our earliest ancestors in the uh, agricultural revolution um, developed um, heart disease? So um, we know that heart disease uh, is more frequent as uh, we age, and this uh, graph obviously represents the, the uh, penetration or the incidence of heart disease as we age. But what we're seeing now uh, on the front line, so to speak, is we're seeing a higher incidence at a much younger age. Um, it's not uncommon for me to have to do bypass now on uh, bypass surgery on a patient uh, 40 to 45 years of age. And that uh, in the past was never heard of or, or was very unprecedented. Uh, but it's becoming much more frequent in the clinics. And I think that many of you who are familiar with the literature uh, may know that there are some alternatives to the cholesterol hypothesis for the generation of cardiovascular disease. 
and one of them is uh, the inflammatory um, hypothesis. And this is uh, from a major medical journal, the Journal of American College of Cardiology. So this is the epicenter of uh, cardi cardiology and cardiovascular publications um, in the literature right now. And um, here we have a, a nice uh, review article uh, from Dr. Libby about the inflammatory uh, hypothesis in atherosclerosis. And really, I think that this is uh, very important to understand because um, this is an alternative uh, paradigm that is emerging and is getting a lot more traction. Um, it has not yet made its way to the clinic in terms of uh, actual impacting um, daily practice, but what it does show us is that, that there are alternatives other than just monitoring and treating patients with uh, statins and, and cholesterol modification. But um, from this, uh, this study, or this paradigm, excuse me, is, the, is that inflammation may be the source uh, for much, if not all, of the uh, um, cardiovascular disease that uh, we develop. And here you can see that uh, in this figure that we have uh, something called the innate immunity, which is uh, cellular-based. Uh, and then uh, this is the adaptive immunity, um, which uh, has uh, different um, cell types uh, and antibodies. Uh, for uh, the evolution of heart, heart disease and cardiovascular disease. You can see that many of the uh, paradigms or many of the molecules that are involved in um, um, looking at uh, inflammatory diets and other health, uh, uh, health problems actually uh, co uh, overlap with the development of cardiovascular disease. And so here's an example of um, many of the uh, markers as well as uh, biochemical um, um, functions that are going on on the cellular surface that are leading to uh, atherosclerosis and uh, cardiovascular disease. And we've heard many of the speakers uh, talk about the oxidative uh, potential or the, the problem with oxida oxidation. And you can see here oxidative LDL. Uh, so you take that LDL, you oxidate it on the surface of a cell, more likely to be involved in uh, implementing and, and developing cardiovascular disease. So this, uh, this whole inflammatory uh, uh, cascade and inflammatory hypothesis is certainly evolving, but we need to study it more. It's, a, it's right now a, a paradigm that is uh, being looked at, but it's not yet something that is front and center in uh, the pr practice guidelines. And so here's the concept is that uh, we all know that uh, one of the benefits, there are many, but one of the benefits of an ancestral diet or paleo diet um, is an anti-inflammatory response. It decreases a lot of the uh, generalized inflammation. And so by decreasing inflammation, you decrease the biomarkers uh, for cardiovascular disease and then subsequently you prevent or slow the progression of heart disease. So it may be that uh, through uh, many of the uh, dietary modifications that are being recommended, um, we can actually alter the inflammatory cascade, thence, uh, thus uh, uh, minimizing um, cardiovascular disease buildup. So what evidence do we have uh, that this might be the case? Well, here's a uh, recent publication, uh, once again, from the Journal of American Cardio Co College of Cardiology, front and center, uh, epicenter for cardiology, um, on dietary strategies for improving postprandial glucose, lipids, inflammation, and cardiovascular health. And so here it's interesting to show that uh, you could see that this uh, sh shows a post-challenge glucose uh, relative to coronary ather atherosclerosis uh, progression. And you can see that if there is an elevated glucose uh, response um, that uh, there's actually a decrease um, in the uh, amount of cardiovascular built up. So if, the, so if you do not have that high glucose peak or spike after eating, and so it's blunted, um, then um, you uh, actually are preventing your uh, risk for cardiovascular disease. And that may be why many of the type 2 diabetics or insulin resistant uh, may be developing heart disease at a higher rate. Uh, once again, here is a, uh, a figure that uh, talks once again about many of the biomarkers that are involved in the cardiovascular stress. And so here's a, a comment from the paper. And once again, this is a recent publication. This is in the epicenter of a cardiology medicine saying that the modern calorie-dense, nutrient-poor diet of processed foods, especially when combined with a sedentary lifestyle and abdominal obesity, produces exaggerated postpandial increase in glucose and lipids, which leads to an inflammation and atherosclerosis. And they go on and talk about the dietary aspects of this. Their, their dietary uh, prescription is a little bit different than what uh, many of the ancestral health people would recommend, but it's certainly a uh, connection between the dietary and cardiovascular risk myth. So how do we talk, how do we move forward together in today's healthcare environment? So 
um, as physicians, we're obligated uh, by many, many regulatory bodies to uh, follow standard guidelines. And these guidelines are evidence-based. And here's an example for uh, coronary uh, revascularization. And so these are published, uh, peer-reviewed, they're reviewed, they're based off of the latest scientific ev evidence in the literature, uh, and it takes many, many years to generate the data and then implement. Um, some studies have shown that it takes about 10, uh, 10 years for um, the, the implementation of uh, something being published in the literature to it actually making it to a guideline in the clinic that physicians can use. And that's a long time, and that level of inertia is probably unacceptable, uh, but that's where the, uh, the uh, creative destruction of healthcare that we're evolving to will probably expedite that situation. So for example, uh, for many of you who uh, know CPR or have been updated recently, that there's a new uh, paradigm of hands-only CPR. So the uh, breathing component has been eliminated in many situations, and so it's taken many, many years to even just change the, the CPR, and you can imagine what it's going to take to change many of these other um, recommendations that are uh, currently uh, in the literature. And so the existing guidelines represent the standard of care in healthcare, and, and, and really this uh, is uh, monitored and affected by professional certification of the physician. Uh, the malpractice is affected by this. Uh, this is peer review within your uh, local institutions and also your institutional privileges. So there are some very important uh, professional reasons why many physicians are obligated to follow the guidelines. But that may be frustrating if you go into your doctor's office and you uh, um, have read some interesting updated literature and you want to begin a, a dialogue. And so you just got to remember that when you go in the office, all physicians are bound to, to, to practice within the professional guidelines but they don't yet include the uh, latest research, uh, including uh, many of the ancestral health and, and diet lifestyle stuff that we're actually learning about at this conference. So as a patient, you may be better informed about the science of a paleo diet and ancestral health than many of the physicians that you go see. And I think you just have to accept that. But I think it, it will lead to a nice dialogue that you can have um, with your physician. And so I think the immediate uh, concept would be uh, begin this dialogue and don't expect your physician to immediately get it. I don't think this is something that intuitively they're going to understand uh, and it's going to take some time. And remember that it took you a lot of time to get to this point as well. It took a lot of study, a lot of research, um, and a lot of time on your own to understand this. And I think the physicians that are taking care of you uh, need that as well. And so I think if you can provide relevant resources when you go into the clinic to, uh, to help your physician, um, I think that would be important. And try to uh, use peer-reviewed or medically uh, published uh, articles or references uh, as a way of beginning that dialogue. You can certainly uh, expand out of that, but uh, just accept that over time your doctor will have that uh, dialogue with you. And, and, and likewise, on the, on the flip side, we as physicians need to be careful in recommending this to patients who may not be familiar with this. Um, and so we need to kind of choose our references wisely as well and have those discussions and document them appropriately. So in conclusion, uh, I just want to remind you that um, we, we're all familiar with farm-to-table restaurants, but I think what we're looking at in the f future is a dawn of a farm-to-table healthcare environment where uh, nutrition and exercise and lifestyle uh, play an even larger role in preventing uh, patients from ending up on uh, these types of tables. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, great presentation, thank you. Um, obviously, you know, there are a lot of constraints to your practice. Uh, the government regulatory bodies try to keep a hands-off approach for not regulating the practice of medicine. Um, I know that because I work at the FDA, unfortunately. <laughs> I know I'm back, we'll probably get a lot of booze in here. Um, specifically, I do work on cardiovascular devices on the pre-market side. Wow. Um, so I I'm curious as to if you've done any, if you've implemented any of this in your clinical practice, specifically, you know, you have someone come in presenting with like a five and a half centimeter aortic aneurysm and, you know, you, do you tell this diabetic 70 year old man, oh, hey, why don't you follow a paleo diet instead or are you treating with an endovascular graft? You know, what is your course of action? Have you seen any benefits to implementing this in the clinic? That's a great question. Um, and um, I've begun to implement this conservatively in the post-operative care. So if somebody has a cardiovascular disease that needs conventional surgery or treatment, I'll treat it and take care of the immediate problem. 
But on the flip side, hopefully we can make this intervention that can prevent future developments in that, in that same patient. And so I've begun having a constructive dialogue with many of the patients um, because many of them have the risk factors of diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. And so I think they're primed for this type of, uh, of, uh, of opportunity and, and uh, diet. So I've had that di dialogue with many patients. Many of them um, are resistant because they, first of all, some of them won't even stop smoking. So I don't think that they're going to adopt uh, many of the ancestral uh, lifestyle uh, that we're recommending anyway. But, but there are some that are getting it and uh, obviously having very positive results. Great. Thank you. That's actually all the time we have. Let's thank uh, Dr. Wheatley again. Thank you. Thank you.